All right, good morning, everyone. Um, we have, let's see, we have 42 folks online and we've got a lot of folks here in the room. Uh, folks are checking in online from all over. Um, Drake's got his community out here as well as his other committee members. I want to welcome in particular, Dr. Paul Bones, who's a professor here in sociology and Professor Donna Mejia, who's a professor at University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, who made up, <clears throat> along with myself, Drake's master's thesis committee. It's been wonderful to work with them and get Donna's perspective as a dance scholar and as a professional belly dancer and Dr. Bohm's expertise in gender um, on this master's thesis entitled From Bal Anat to Habiru, an oral history of John Compton, American male belly dancer. Um, for this, uh, Thesis, as you'll hear, uh, Drake conducted an oral history of John Compton, who passed away um, about a, a little more than a decade ago. So he interviewed over 16 of John's friends, collaborators, um, fellow dancers, fellow company members, as well as did a lot of archival research as to sort of why is it we think what we do about men in belly dancing or about issues of masculinity and femininity in belly dancing, as well as uh, analyze some of John's work. Um, so you'll hear a lot about this today. Um, uh, Drake will present for 25 minutes. Then we'll have about 25 minutes for Q&A. And folks online, if you have questions, I'll monitor the chat so I can bring your questions into the space. And if folks in the space also have questions as well. Um, so I think without further ado, I'm going to turn it right over to Drake. All right. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for that lovely introduction. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still recovering from a bout of COVID. Um, yes, as Rosemary said, this is the presentation of my thesis research from Balanat to Hobby Roo. And as you can see here on the screen, we have a few lovely photos of John here on the left. These are consecutive throughout his career. So let's get started. All right. Hello. This is the introduction. So uh, my master's research is an oral history of the professional career of the late male belly dancer, John Compton. John danced from 1972 to through the 2012, passing away on October 24th, 2012. Uh, he is credited with being the most prolific American male belly dancer in US history, and his influence shaped the trends, aesthetics, and movement canon of early fusion belly dance. John is held in very high esteem in the belly dance community. Upon conducting my interviews for this project, it became clear that he was profoundly and fiercely loved by those who knew him, though he has a reputation for being somewhat problematic. Many dancers whom he had burned bridges with reassured me that they had enduring love and respect for John. So this tells me that these transgressions were not eclipsed by the overall impact he had in their lives and on the community. In other words, John is a golden boy in the eyes of the belly dance community. Purpose statement. So purpose of this thesis research is to conduct an oral history of the late American belly dancer, John Compton, whose influence has inspired generations of male belly dancers. Through interviews with informants who danced with, learned from, and were inspired by John's career, this thesis research will not only expand the historical record in belly dance scholarship, but will also situate contemporary male belly dancers in the history of fusion belly dance in the United States. My research was guided primarily by the following research questions. First is, how did John's work as a male belly dancer inform the culture of fusion belly dance in the United States? Uh, so this question expands on the extant historical analysis of belly dance in the US. And my second question, how did ideas and theories of masculinity play a role in John's stage persona and dance stylization? This question interrogates the way the theory of multiple masculinities handles theoretical questions about the behavior of male belly dancers. And now I get to talk about myself. 
So this is my positionality statement. I am a white transgender man with a professional background in belly dance performance and teaching. Uh, this personal identity informs the way I intellectualize, understand, and embody gender and masculinity. As of the writing of this, I am 30 years old and I've been studying belly dance for about 15 years, so about half of my life. As a professional belly dancer, I have a certain insider status with the belly dance community. And while this provided me with many industry connections, it also meant that my reputation in the community came into consideration when conducting interviews and adjudicating what made it to the final manuscript. And while I have a long history with the belly dance community, I don't have a personal connection to John Compton. This creates some emotional distance between me and my perception of John, which might grant me a greater degree of objectivity. However, it could also pose a barrier to my ability to understand the impact of John's stagecraft. And finally, concurrently with this master's thesis, I completed a post-baccalaureate certificate in multicultural women's and gender studies. And as such, my perspectives on the issues I address are heavily informed by critical theories such as intersectionality theory, critical race theory, and feminism. Give you another second to bask in this glorious photo move forward. All right, belly dance background. So now I get to tell you what even is belly dance. Uh, belly dance is a highly contested umbrella term for a multiplicity of dances across Southwest Asia, North Africa, Turkey, and Hellenic regions. It has no unbroken origin that can be definitively traced to a specific culture, region, or people. We have a quote here from Heather D. Ward. It says, um, the dance is characterized by a core repertoire of torso movements, including articulated hip and shoulder movements, such as shimmies, circles, and figure eights of the pelvis and undulations of the abdomen. In this thesis, the term belly dance is used to indicate the Egyptian diasporic concert version of this dance, known in Arabic as rock sharki, or Eastern dance in English. Uh, dancers in the Middle East also commonly refer to this as Oriental dance, but due to the pejorative history of the term Oriental, I don't personally endorse the usage of that term in the United States. In my writing, I use the term fusion belly dance to specifically refer to the hybridized style of belly dance that is informed primarily by the movement canon of Jamila Salampour, which is the style that John performed. And though belly dance is primarily practiced and commercialized on women, men have been performing belly dance just as long as women have, both in the Middle East and the United States. Methodology. So my methodology for this project was oral history. And oral history is the process of conducting and recording interviews and then transcribing those interviews and submitting them to some form of repository for future researchers to analyze and come to their own conclusions. It is a way of using memory to construct history, especially those histories that are often left out of conventional history sources. In this way, oral history can be emancipatory and reparative. I have a quote here from Lynn Abrams. It says, oral history was intended to give a voice to the voiceless, a narrative to the storyless, and power to the marginalized. And similarly, Alessandro Portelli writes, oral sources give us information about people or social groups whose written history is either missing or distorted. The stories of Middle Eastern, uh, male Middle Eastern dancers have been suppressed and marginalized throughout history, largely due to the homophobic sensibilities of the European travel, travel writers who sought to civilize the Middle East through colonization. An oral history narrative allows for these stories to be heard in a way other methodologies cannot. And finally, John passed away in 2012, and the majority of his work took place before the internet and social media. Therefore, his story lives primarily in the memories of those who knew him. So in a way, an oral history approach was the only way to answer my research questions. Theoretical frameworks. So these are the theories that I used when writing my thesis. First of all, 
We have multiple masculinities. This is a theory pioneered by the scholar Ray Wynn Connell. It is a capacious, multiplicitous model of masculinity that recognizes multiple forms of hegemonic and non-hegemonic masculinities on three levels, local, regional, and global. This is the lens I used to examine how generational differences affected concepts of masculinity and as a framework for conceptualizing John's, brand, John's own brand of masculinity. So, hegemonic masculinities are masculinities that legitimate an unequal relationship between men and women, masculinity and femininity, and among masculinities. Non-hegemonic masculinities, conversely, are masculinities that do not legitimate gender inequality. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I will be focusing on complicit and subordinate masculinities as defined by Messerschmitt and Raywin Connell first. Complicit masculinities do not actually embody hegemonic masculinity, yet through practice realize some of the benefits of unequal gender relations. And subordinate masculinities are constructed as lesser than or aberrant and deviant to hegemonic masculinity. Based on these definitions, I contend that John's masculinity on the local level, so like within the belly dance community, is a variation of complicit masculinity, whereas John's masculinity on the regional and global levels would qualify as a subordinate masculinity. And second, we have multiple Orientalisms. This was formally named by Anthony Shea, but it was first referenced by Edward Said. This is the lens I used to analyze John's choices in regards to his movement stylization, his stage persona, his visual aesthetic, and his troupe dynamic with Hobby Roo. In his book, Orientalism, Edward Said details how the West constructs and defines the East as the exotic other, which can result in the perpetuation of false information and stereotypes. And though Said does differentiate between various Orientalisms, he does not explicitly define them. So to address this, uh, Shea proposes the concept of multiple Orientalisms, which attends to the many ways Orientalism is deployed. And I have the quote here. It is a conflicted and multivocalic process. These purposes range from imperialism and denigration to celebration and nostalgia. In other words, not all Orientalism is deployed out of a desire to assert Western hegemony, but out of a desire to express admiration towards a culture that is out of reach, which, while not malevolent or exotifying in intent, is still an insidious expression of Orientalism. All right, now we move on to the findings. So, chapter one, imaginative histories of men in belly dance. Chapter one establishes the historical context for the remainder of this thesis with an examination of the misinformation that has circulated through belly dance discourses for centuries. Uh, in this chapter, I break down these popular misconceptions into two discrete theories, first of which is the mother goddess theory. So this theory is based in the belief that belly dance is a by women for women art due to the alleged primeval goddess worshiping roots. This belief is usually deployed as a tactic for excluding men from the historical narrative of Middle Eastern dance and is inherently colonialist in the way it reimagines the history of belly dance to suit one's own spiritual beliefs. The quote I have here from Stavros Cariani, constructing modern oriental dance as a female fertility ritual silences the widespread custom of male dancers in the East. The origin of this theory um, is from Armin Ohanian's book, The Dancer of Shamaka. In her book, Ohanian describes belly dance as a sacred holy dance about the mystery and pain of motherhood, which all true Asiatic men watch with reverence and humility. She believes the West perverted this maternity dance into what we now call belly dance. This theory was popularized uh, by Jamila Salampour. In the 1972 Balanat documentary, Jamila expressed the belief that belly dance comes from an ancient Mesopotamian religion as a form of preparation for childbirth. 
She taught these concepts early in her career, but as she gained more knowledge, she did eventually stop teaching this. And in a way, this belief is baked into the roots of early fusion belly dance. Many scholars have unanimously agreed that there is no proof that belly dance traces back to pre-biblical matriarchal societies or that belly dance has ever had spiritual, devotional, or religious significance. Our second theory here is impersonator theory. This is the common myth that historical predecessors of male belly dancers were impersonating women for one reason or another. The origin for this are the travelogues of European colonizers from the 17th to the 19th century who had preconceived ideas about what constituted appropriate gendered behavior and when, uh, when witnessing male dancers performing what appeared to be in women's clothing and moving in a feminine way, they made assumptions about the intent behind it. So this was popularized by many travelogues dating long, long, long time ago, but the most popular one and the most cited one is by Edward W. Lane in his book, Manners and Customs of Modern Egyptians. Uh, the passage goes, as they personate women, their dress is suited to their unnatural profession, being partly male and partly female. The spread and privileging of these colonial narratives about men in the Middle East further silences sovereign native knowledges and epistemologies. Many scholars have since shared how this theory was purely a Western construction as audiences native to the Middle East knew that those dancers were in fact men. And here I just included a few photos uh, to give some context. These are photos of early predecessors to male belly dancers, the Kowal and the Kochek dancers. You can see from their costumes why European travelers may have made the assumptions that they did. And in that passage by Edward W. Lane that I just read, he was referring specifically to Kowal dancers, so such as the far left in the middle photo here. Chapter two, John Compton and oral history. This is, of course, the oral history of John Compton's working career as a belly dancer. So we have John's life and early career. A quote from John, it reads, well, I saw Balanot first. They were the first belly dancers I ever saw. I didn't know what belly dancers were before that. I was at the Northern California Renaissance Fair when I saw them and I'd sit there mesmerized by the music. So Balanot is Jamila Salampour's first uh, belly dance troupe. And we have our timeline. So from 73 to 75, John danced with Balanot. He was the first male dancer with Balanot. Um, this was Jamila's belly dance show at the Ren Fair. And today it is the longest running belly dance show in the world, which is now under the direction of Suhaila Salampour, Jamila's daughter. Um, after learning that he would have to alternate out his dancing with another male dancer in the show, John lost his temper and he quit Balanot and defected to the other multicultural dance show at the fair, Baba Ganoush. So Baba Ganoush, he danced with for just one season in 75. This was a multicultural dance company that shared the stage at the Renaissance Fair with Balanot, and it was run by a woman named Patty Farber. They focused more on folkloric dances as opposed to purely belly dance. Uh, and after this, the, the fair fired all of the non-European acts. So that's why they only danced, that's why he only danced with Baba Ganesh for the one season. So after this, he formed a company called Koskidas with former Baba Ganesh dancer, Charlene Sawyer, primarily conceptualized to perform at the De Young Museum's famous King Tut exhibit. He danced with them from 75 to about 1981. And after Koskidas mutually drifted apart, John had a period of time where he was not affiliated exclusively with a troupe, uh, where he did a lot of solo work at restaurants and clubs. Next, we have the Gypsy Moor Dancers from 86 to 91. So this was a small, short-lived company formed by former Balanot dancer Mish Mish, along with John, some previous Balanot and Baba Ganoush dancers, and a woman named Sage Hoban. 
they performed at the Northern California Renaissance Pleasure Fair. Ultimately, Mishmish departed from the troupe and bequeathed ownership to John and his best friend and former Balanot dancer, Rita Alderucci. Which leads us to Hobby Roo from 1992 to about 2008. So uh, after claim, claiming ownership, uh, John and Rita renamed the troupe to Hobby Roo. The original troupe was small, comprised solely of the core group of Gypsy Moore dancers, but eventually grew to 16 members, including musicians and apprentices. John picked the name Hobby Roo after watching a documentary on Egyptology, learning that the term Hobby Roo referred to people who pilfered tombs. Hobby Roo used dances from Baba Ganoush and had the same visual aesthetic as Balanat. The way that they describe themselves uh, varied from source to source, but three descriptors I have here were old world folkloric, flashy folkloric, and tribal folkloric. So it's clear that folkloric was a very important signifier to their brand. So officially, their defunct website states, Bedouin tribes who wandered the Arabian deserts, enriching themselves by taking what they pleased from the many countries they traversed. Like these Bedouins, the Hobby Roo dance ensemble's performance style has been influenced by the folkloric dances and music of many regions of North Africa and the Middle East. And we have a photo here of Hobby Roo from their website. Uh, they actually labeled this photo Happy Roo, which I thought was cute. All right, now we have a video of John Compton's dancing. So to prepare us for the next section where I discuss John's performance of masculinity, I made this short compilation of his dancing, both with his tray and without. I want you to notice his hip and spine articulation, his upper body posture, and his usage of uh, hopping and some other interesting footwork. So enjoy. And we have slide 13, chapter three, performance and masculinity. So uh, this chapter details the relationship between John's performance of masculinity, choreographic embodiment and Orientalism. So dance and masculinity, John's tray dance, uh, movement analysis. So during this analysis, I noticed three distinct patterns. First was his simple belly dance technique. As you saw in the video, uh, his belly dance technique was not overly complex. His hip and spine articulation was rather stiff and overall did not have uh, a lot of fluidity. Next was his tray balancing and push-ups. So his tray dance was somewhat formulaic. He typically recycled the same sequences when he performed, but he would improvise a lot of the details. So John was famous for doing those push-ups with the tray on his head. And I can speak to personal experience that that is very hard to do. And finally, uh, folkloric and ballroom influence. So everyone I interviewed described John's style as stiff and masculine. Uh, to me, stiffness is somewhat antithetical to belly dance, but is more common in the folkloric dances that he used and in ballroom, which he did as a child. 
So as we saw in the video when he was doing those little hopping steps there towards the end, those are characteristic of the folkloric dance known as, known as Debki, which he and Javi Ru did often. Next is uh, John and masculinity. So John openly expressed negative opinions about other male belly dancers, possibly as a tactic for elevating his own reputation. I have a quote from him here. John says, I know there are some other men that belly dance. They're girly men. They dance too feminine. This is to deliberately misunderstand the aesthetic philosophy of belly dance. Belly dance is by and large a feminine dance style and to insist that it is danced in a way that asserts masculinity would make it unrecognizable as belly dance. John's unique hybridization of styles expressed masculinity, but not because belly dance, not because of belly dance. Um, it was because of the folkloric influence, his push-ups, uh, ballroom influence, and his stiffness. So that is to say, his belly dance technique may have suffered from his stiffness and his lack of fluidity, but it did contribute to the overall masculine impression that he gave. Next, Orientalism and masculinity. So, uh, John's masculinity is largely rooted in an Orientalist trope called the Sheik, which was given to him, a nickname given to him in 1977 by the San Francisco Chronicle. They called him John the Sheik Compton. Uh, the Sheik is a very old trope that has always been a caricature of Islamophobic stereotypes. And John's usage of the term Sheik is culturally exploitative and problematic inherently. And finally, the harem fantasy of Hobby Roo. So in an interview, John described Hobby Roo's troop dynamic as the crazy sheik with his wives and his eunuch sons. So this treats other cultures as fodder for living out an imaginative history with glamorous alternate identities. As John and the majority of Hobby Roo were white Americans, they had the privilege of assimilating into the dominant culture at the top of the racial hierarchy in ways that real Arab and Middle Eastern people cannot. It's a costume they get to take off at the end of the day. It's like cosplaying as a marginalized group using Middle Eastern stereotypes. And next. Conclusion, uh, findings from chapter four. So influence. I broke down John's influence into three primary categories, first of which was being a role model for male belly dancers. In 2013, Princess Farhana wrote a dedication to John in the Belly Dance Chronicles where she wrote, During his lifetime, John influenced legions of dancers, and like a pioneer, he paved the way for men in belly dance, especially here in the United States. Next is stagecraft. Uh, I define stagecraft as the culmination of everything that goes into the conceptualization of a performance from stage presence, personality, alchemy, and other unquantifiable qualities that come together to create the magic on stage. So Mira Crean in our interview told me, there are certain people who come out on stage and you feel like they are utterly there for you. They just want to make you feel and they will do whatever they can to bring a smile to your face and bring you that kind of joy and happiness. That was John and that's generous. Uh, and lastly, we have authenticity. So John's charismatic, humorous personality inspired generations of performers and teachers to adopt these characteristics as pedagogical strategies, business practices, and in dance making. So in our interview, Amaya said, I think he was the first person to instill in me the idea that you have to be yourself. Don't be like somebody else and don't be like a certain genre. Don't be like a certain style because there was nobody like John at the time. And that's why we all looked at him because he was not like anybody else. And in this photo here on the right, you can see some of his goofiness as he is pretending to pull himself up with an invisible rope. So as stated before, John was considered a golden boy. I discussed the ways in which he was both a formative and complicated figure. Uh, his influence has profoundly impacted the conceptualization of fusion belly dance in the U.S. from his movement canon, visual aesthetic, and personality. And finally, coming to the end, 
future research. So this project inspired several exigencies for future research. So first is excavating other histories of male belly dancers, such as Ibrahim Farah, Ahmad Jarjour, and Bert Balladine. So this research into John inspired me to propose a more comprehensive historical research project that focuses on other pivotal male belly dancers in US history. Second is further interrogation and exploration of how the concept of masculinity operates in belly dance. Popular theories of masculinity and gender don't quite account for the ways in which male belly dancers complicate these discourses. And there is much more to be explored here. And finally, a deeper analysis and critique of how Orientalism undergirds much of the stylization and history of fusion belly dance. More and more of these Orientalist practices are being called out and criticized, and there is always more work to be done to bring awareness to the harmful effects of these practices. All right, thank you. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. I am happy to take questions now. I'll go ahead and exit out of this. Can you hear us, Drake? I can now. Yay. Okay, okay. good. Great. Yay. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Well, everyone, um, so thank you so much, Drake, for that um, really wonderful presentation. So we've got lots of folks here in the room, as you can see, and we've also got 76 people online. <laughs> so I will do my best here to facilitate both questions from the audience here live and then also online. So if you're on Zoom and you have a question you'd like to ask, please type, type it in the chat and I will bring it in. So far we're seeing lots of congratulations. Is there anyone in the room who has a question? I actually did receive one in a direct message, um, if it's okay. Oh, sure, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so Tanji asks, how is his legacy viewed in the American belly dance community? So as of all of the interviews suggested uh, and looking through Facebook posts and comments on photos and comments on videos. Um, John was beloved, like absolutely beloved. Um, as I said, there were a few people that he rubbed the wrong way over the years. Um, he definitely liked to gossip and he would sometimes uh, make fun of some people during his his interviews um, during classes to get laughs. So he was known for being a clown and for saying whatever he had to, to get a rise out of people, to make people laugh. Um, but overall, his legacy is considered profound, I would say, to the American belly dance community. Maybe you could say something even about like how you came to this topic through your um, experiential student um, project where you interviewed a number of male and masculine belly dancers. Maybe give that a little bit of background. Sure. So in undergrad, I did a um, experiential student learning project that was funded by the Experiential Student Scholar Program. And I used this project to interview male belly dancers, male and masculine belly dancers in the United States uh, to kind of get just a sense for what their lives were like as performers, both what sorts of privileges uh, that they had um, and some of the oppression that they faced. And I, from that, from those interviews, so I got to interview eight people and from those interviews, um, John Compton was cited as an, a source of inspiration for almost everyone, as either the first male belly dancer they'd ever seen, or um, as someone they looked up to as like a formative male role model. 
because uh, as I as I mentioned that he was considered a role model, um, obviously for lots of people, but especially to men. Um, so from that, I figured that it seemed like there was something more significant about John that was not explored and that inspired a deeper dive into his life. Great, thank you. Any questions in the room? Yeah, Christina. Um, we're getting a mic to Christina in the back. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, hi. Um, my question is in composing this oral history and doing all of these interviews, did it have any impact on your own practice of belly dance? And if so, what, how did that, what did it look like? And yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, that is a great question. And it's gonna make me emotional. Um, it did. And for one thing, his dancing just in general, he's so joyful to watch. And something that I struggle with, um, and this is maybe not something that makes a lot of sense to people outside of the belly dance community, but in fusion belly dance, there's often this like race to complexity and this race to maximalism when it comes to technique and trying to do um, as many layers as possible and be as impressive and just like always always trying to do the most and it's sometimes it's really hard to keep up with um, especially if that's not your personal movement aesthetic and it's easy when you're kind of wrapped up in the community to kind of get caught in this um this trap of always trying to outdo yourself and it's, it's impossible to do that. You can't always be transcending. You can't always do 5,000 things at the same time. And seeing how John danced was, as, as I said in the presentation, you know, it was very, his belly dance technique was simple. He didn't study belly dance for a very long time before he only, he only studied for about two weeks before he started performing. So his belly dance technique level was not super high level the way we see in fusion belly dance today like in some of the high profile dancers we see today but it was impactful and people still loved him and seeing that it's like it gave me permission to let go of some of that expectation of myself that i always have to be transcending or that i always have to be trying to do 800 layers at the same time and breathe and smile. Um, so that was, in, in a movement practice, that's what mostly impacted me. Um, and life-wise, he, um, John died from complications with AIDS. He lived with AIDS for several decades, um, but he danced up until he couldn't. And I have a, I don't have the quote right in front of me, well, there's a quote that he gave that says something like, you can either lay in bed and, and wait to die. Um, <clears throat> oh, this is sad. <clears throat> Makes me emotional. Or you can dance. And that just meant a lot to me. So oh, thank you <laughs> for your question. Thanks, Christina. I see we have a question um, in the chat. Does anybody else in the room have a question right now? Yeah, in the back. Let's get you a microphone. And then from that, we'll go to the question that was in the chat. Oh, my goodness. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So um, my question isn't fully gathered, but did John's like lack of study in belly dance before performing, do you think that's what affected his like true understanding of belly dance and like the culture around it because you did say like he criticized other male belly dancers for and saying that they were too feminine in the way they danced do you think that could have added to his lack of like maybe that came from his lack of knowledge of the culture that is a great question thank you uh yes so um to kind of build up to the answer to that so something that i learned when talking to suhaila salampour 
when I interviewed her for my thesis was how her mother, Jamila, John's first teacher, always was frustrated that people would study with her for a very short period of time and then they would leave and go teach her format and kind of build from that, but they didn't stay long enough to get to that sort of cultural, um, get, to, get to that point where more of the cultural implications and uh, learning the history, learning things like rhythms, like music rhythms, Middle Eastern rhythms, um, they would leave before they got to that point because this was a time in the early 70s where that was, now we call them like six week wonders. You know, you take a class for six weeks and you think you're ready to be a professional. Um, that was not uncommon back then. And there was always this race to commercialization and this race to take it and make money as opposed to trying to slow down develop, learn, learn history, learn culture, uh, however you want to think about that. Um, so yes, I would say that John's brief studying with Jamila was probably not um, sufficient to today's standards of what we would expect someone who is a high level professional belly dancer to know about belly dance before um, performing it and before teaching it. Let me make sure I tackled that whole question. I typed it down for myself. So yes, um, and some of his opinions on male belly dancers, to be fair, um, yes, I disagree with them. And that documentary was from 2008 when he said that. But to be fair, the scholarship on belly dance is still very 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 small and when he started dancing it was so much smaller i i don't even know if you would even there's maybe a couple of articles that existed about it and the articles that existed about it said that it was a childbirth preparation dance so he did not start with having access to that knowledge at all so the fact that he went through his career thinking these things you know, the, you you can't know what you don't know, um, if if that makes sense. So yes, to answer your question, I would say that his uh, his his period of time that he studied was probably not sufficient to what we would consider today to be what you expect of a professional belly dancer. There also wasn't much you could access at that time. Right, Drake. You even talk in your dissertation about how at first when. Uh, when John approached Jamila wanting to study, she said no, um, because men don't belly dance. And it was, wasn't it a, a, one of her own company members who brought her some research that, that even Jamila, who was considered the expert in the US at the time, didn't know about that made her change her mind, right? This is through this time when really even the, the professionals and experts didn't have a lot of information. Absolutely, exactly. Um, yes. So. It is the famous story of John trying to track Jamila down to get her to teach him. But John or uh, Jamila refused to teach men because it was her opinion that there was no historical precedent for men belly dancing. And it wasn't until she read, at least to what I understand from the research, um, until she read modern, uh, Manners and Customs of Modern Egyptians and learned about the Kowal dancers, she that was what changed her mind into believing that men were allowed to learn to belly dance. Uh, and in an interview I did with Mish Mish, she did tell me that she frequently would be whispering in Jamila's ear about John and some of the other men who wanted to study with her. Um, so there was some pressure from within and without, uh, but it wasn't until she accessed that book that she ultimately made the decision to let John study with her. Great, and we've got um, we got four questions in the chat right now. Um, I'm just gonna maybe bring them all into the room here for folks and you can kind of um, bring them together. Um, one is based on your research, how will John's legacy inform the future of males within belly dance? That's from Raven. Uh, Lindy says, if you don't mind, could you talk about your personal experience dealing with audience members challenging your place in the belly dance community? For example, how do you deal with folks who approach you after a show and say you shouldn't be doing this style of dance? 
as a dancer in the community, I know we end up doing a lot of education on the spot after getting off stage. Um, two other questions. How do you approach, uh, from Luca, how do you approach the quote unquote, be yourself joy his dance practice communicated with his quote about quote unquote, feminine men? How do you reconcile and navigate those two quotes within your own practice? And then there was one more from Cher. Has belly dance and your research helped influence other styles of your dancing and performance in what way? So I'll let you, Drake, sort of navigate your way through those many questions. Yeah, um, I have all of these copy and pasted into a document in order. So I will do my best. I also got a private question um, sent in a private message that I, I can actually start with and then I'll bust my way down. So uh, the first question that I have before shares was from Elisa and she asks, can you share how you give historical context when sharing your movement practices, how it's threaded into your teaching? So about my teaching, uh, I primarily use a teaching format called Dance Cohesion. It was pioneered, created by April Rose. And the format has history built into it. So as you teach every stage, you talk more about history and it goes consecutively starting from um, more, uh, more ancient Egyptian era and then moving forward into more contemporary history. And with that, I have just sort of added my own bullet points onto it from my own research. And so at, at, it's like at the beginning of the lesson, uh, we have like opening circle, circle time where we all sit together and we go over the history from that week of the format and then we move into our movement practice. So that is how I thread it in. I also, you know, I have movement workshops. I also have lecture workshops. So sometimes I just get to do nothing but this for, you know, three hours. Uh, with Cher's question, uh, Cher asks, has belly dance and your research helped influence other styles of your dance and in what way? Uh, yes, so I would say belly dance informs all of my movement practices. And I primarily identify as a belly dancer, but I do use a lot of contemporary modern dance because those are what, that's what my degrees are in. And West African vernacular dance, there's always this thread of belly dance technique that is just permanently installed in my body. It's like a program running underneath all the other programs that get layered on top of it. And it has, there, there are certain aesthetic qualities that belly dance uses that are unique that uh, a lot of other dance styles like, um, like, like ballroom and ballet don't have. So when I take a class like that, sometimes my belly dance training is considered a hindrance and I have spent a lot of time trying to, uh, with, with teachers telling me to basically stop being so noodly. Uh, but in other dance styles, like when I did take contemporary modern in undergrad and for a few semesters in grad school, um, there were things that other people had struggled to access, like spinal articulation, fluidity in the spine and the hips uh, and the rib cage that I had no trouble with because that is what I do. Like, that that's just another day's work for me. So uh, it just kind of depends on where I am, if that, it, whether it helps or it hinders, if that makes sense. We've got about two minutes left, Drake. Okay, let me pick, let me pick a question. Okay, I really liked, um, okay, I'm gonna answer Luca's question. So Luca asks, how do you approach the Be Yourself Joy His Dance Practiced? Dance practice communicated with his quote about feminine men, and how do you reconcile and navigate that quote with your own practice? So I have been belly dancing for about 15 years. And at this point, those kinds of comments about like it being too girly or too feminine, it's just water off a duck's butt. I don't, I don't really listen to it. Um, I don't agree with it. And so as far as reconciling with it, uh, there's really not much to reconcile because I just think it's wrong. Um, like I said, I think it is 
kind of antithetical to say you shouldn't belly dance in a feminine way because then what would it look like? Uh, I, it wouldn't really look like belly dance anymore. So being myself and finding joy outside of that is, I guess, just maybe based in that sense of myself uh, and that comfort with knowing that the way I choose to move my body is not somehow contradictory or invalidating of my gender. Because they're just, this is just how I choose to move my meat sack. Um, and that might be where we need to bring it to a close. <laughs> Although I do, um, there was just um, something in the chat I wanted to pull out from Liz, who says, thank you for choosing my brother for your thesis. He would be so happy that he still remembered. He loved to perform and always added a bit of humor. So thank you so much, Liz, for sharing that with us. Um, thank you so much, Drake, for um, your work today and in your written thesis. And I think we're going to end there. So we have time for all the other wonderful presentations today. Thank you again, Drake. Thank you, everyone who joined us online and in person. Thank you so much.